morning, church. And, uh, I'm a bad nerves right now, church. Um, first time I've ever preached, and I don't know. You know, I feel I feel a little funny, but you know, let's just pray for me. Pray for me. Um, today we're going to get into this message. Let's see if we can get this working. Okay. So my name. Michael Samuel Edwards. Not much to it. You could probably blame my mom for that. Um, but we start in 1985. It was a great year, church. Great year. Um, what can I say? Bell bottoms were in. And uh, I was born. It was a Thursday uh, morning, I believe, mom. Thursday morning? Right, Thursday morning. And uh, yes, that's Sister Edwards right here. Uh, came into the world, and um, through 1988, it was a good time. Then moving on, 1989, 1992, continued to grow. Born in England, and um, lived there for a few years. And uh, we moved over here in 91, and um, life changed. Uh, I became Brooklyn, what can I say? <laughs> I became Brooklyn, and um, I've never looked back. Uh, I love to travel with my parents. We've, we've gone you know, numerous places. Um, we've seen a lot of things. God has really blessed us. And um, of all the things that I can say have happened to me, uh, I'm really happy to be a son of Hanson Place. Amen. I mean, there's a lot to it. I've, I've, I've gained a lot of spiritual help and I've grown here in this church, and, and this is where I call my home. Amen. So today's message is entitled, It's About Time. Let's see if we can get this going. Okay, it's about time. Church, before I go any further, I'd like to thank a lot of my friends and family who have come out and support. You know, it's, it's really a blessing. You, you really find out how people view you when they, when they come out and, and show support for the things you're doing. And I, I'm just really thankful. I see a lot of old uh, school friends and, and, and family, even those who are watching. Uh, please, can we turn to uh, Leviticus 19, verse 32? Leviticus 19, verse 32. And when you have it, please say amen. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God, I am the Lord. I was reading that this week and I thought, you know, I, I really can't preach unless I acknowledge all the elders, all the seniors in this church who've, who've given me spiritual guidance, moral guidance. And matter of fact, God even, you know, has a special blessing for the older and the elderly, especially our seniors. So I just want to acknowledge you. Thank you. Thank you. All my seniors, thank you. Thank you. I have a few disclaimers, church, a few disclaimers. You know what happens when we see, you know, young guys up here preaching. What automatically do we think? Okay, they're going to go off to Andrews, Oakwood, and, and become a pastor. You know, church, for, for very, you know, personal reasons, I, I just, I don't see myself being a pastor. So please, please, if you see me after this, say, you know, good job or, or whatever, but not the pastor, not, not the pastor thing. Please, please, please. Which brings me to my second disclaimer. Everything you see here today, everything and everything you hear is not about me. It's always going to be about God. And um, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. It's always going to be about God. You know, Bible stories are really templates for us. They, they provide us principles that we're supposed to apply to our everyday lives. 
And if we're not applying these principles to our lives, then it's pointless. So today, it's not your typical sermon. It's a hybrid message. It's what we call a sermony, right? right? Or we can call it a testimony. But I have me, I know you like that. Don't steal it. <laughs> so, so much for a good start. Let's talk. January 2011. Interesting time for me, church. Interesting time. Um, I was really depressed. You know, I was, I was going through a lot of issues. Um, family issues. And, you know, I, I couldn't solve problems that I was having at home. Um, academically and professionally, uh, I graduated from Brooklyn College with a degree in chemistry and biology. And, and I wanted to become an eye doctor, you know, because blindness runs really deep in my family. So I was like, God, you know, this is what I want to do. And, um, you know, I had the good grades. I had the, the recommendations. I had the internships. But for the life of me, church, I just couldn't land a position in an optometry school. Professionally, you know, I didn't know, you know, I was just working, but I wasn't happy. I, spiritually, I was dead. You know, three-fourths of the people I grew up in church with, they weren't here anymore. I was looking around. I'm like, Lord, why am I still here? Why am I still coming to church? Why am I still even praying? There's no solving to my problems. And I wasn't alone. I was reading an article recently that said, more Americans suffer from quarter-life crisis than ever before, some from financial issues, and this is the age group of 21 to 29. Some uh, you know, suffer from career change. Some suffer from familiar problems. Some, when they emigrate, they lose their character, they lose their identity. And others, pressure to get married. Pressure to get married. Church, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Pray for me. It's not, it's, not, it's not easy being with a Trini woman. Church, 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 pray for me. Okay, let's move on. So January 14, January 14 of last year, I was having worship with Joe, and we were ushering in the Sabbath. And, um, you know, I, I kind of went on a rant. You know, the lesson was about, you know, detailing the lives of, of Abraham and Moses and David. And one theme that I saw throughout all of their stories was that God was always talking to them. And I felt like, uh, so, I mean, what happened to me? You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't party. I mean, I'm a vegan, if that counts for anything, pastor. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm in the church, most of my friends left, I'm still here. Church, what, I mean, God, what's going on? Why would you leave me? So poor Joe, I was throwing out all these questions. She didn't know what to say. She, she was just like, oh, well, I guess we should just pray. And it was a little emotional for me. But that night I went to bed and I had a dream. And in this dream, it opened up with a nice forest scene. <laughs> and I'm walking, church. I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking through this forest. And... Um, then a voice comes to me, right? And the voice says, you know Jesus is coming again soon, right? I go, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> the voice says, so, how are you living for him? I said, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't party. I went through the whole list, Pastor. So the voice says, I want you to have a big lunch every seven Sabbaths. You invite every and anyone, and you have spoken word, poetry, you know, testimonies, prayer, all focusing on the second coming of Christ. So I was like, okay. So I said, you know, how am I supposed to do this? The voice tells me to pray. So I said, okay. I said, where am I supposed to do this? The voice tells me, I want you to have it at a place near a tent on Utica Avenue. So I'm like, okay. And then I woke up. <laughs> so I woke up now, church, and this thing is playing over and over in my mind. I 
come to church, and pastor, you could have preached the most prolific sermon ever. I couldn't tell you what it was. This thing was going over and over in my head, and I told my mom, I told Joe about it, and no answers. So I was like, oh, you know something? I gotta see if there's really a tent on Utica Avenue. If there's really a place, there's a tent on Utica Avenue. So after church, we hopped in my phantom, I mean phantomly van, <laughs> work on me church, and we, we head out to um, Utica Avenue. So we start by boys and girls and we driving up, 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 up. No tent, no tent, no tent. We get all the way to about Mamre. And I'm thinking, maybe it's just the Ezekiel bird I had last night. You know, maybe it's doing a number on me. So I said, all right, you know what, Joe, let's just go home. It's all right. Then my mom calls me. She speaks to Sister Hamilton. And Sister Hamilton said, some of 2010, there was a, a crusade on Utica and I believe Beverly. Uh, Pastor told me, Pastor who? Pastor Jackson. So I said, okay, so we, we bomb it down to Utica and Beverly. And sure enough, what did we see? See if we can get this. Manually. Forward, forward. Okay. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. Go back. One. Okay. So we see this very scene, church. Now, there was no tent, but there was a space big enough to where a tent could have been. So I'm like, okay. And about two doors down, there's a place called Top Civic Center. So now this is all making sense. This is a place near a tent on Euclid Avenue. So you know what I gotta do. My little fist pump. <laughs> I'm like, all right, all right, we're going somewhere now, all right. So there's really a place. So we go inside, we speak to the, the, the uh, manager at the, at the time that was there, and I explain the whole dream to him. I'm saying, well, you know, I had this dream, and I can't believe it's really coming true. Like, this is not making sense, but it's making sense, but I, I, I don't know. So he said, I'll tell you what, come back Tuesday, I set you up with an event planner, and we can get this thing going. So I said, all right. So I'm praying now. I'm like, wow. You know, Friday night, I didn't feel like God was talking to me. Sabbath morning, God says a whole lot. So I'm like, all right, fine. Let's, 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 let's go. Let's go. Let's roll. So we start going. We start going. And I go back on Tuesday, and I sit down with the lady, and she tells me, Mike, um, you know, to get everything going with with. With, with furniture and food and renting the place, it worked out to about five or $6,000 every seven Sabbath to get this thing done. So I'm like, wow, Oof. okay, all right. I said, all right, you know what, I'm gonna pray. So I said, I'm gonna start reading my Bible every day, every day, and praying. The old Crater Roll song, read your Bible, pray every day, started playing back in my head. So I said, all right, I'm gonna pray. So I get in contact with Pastor Bowen, and Pastor Bowen tells me, you know, Mike, I think you should start in Daniel and start reading forward. So I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading, and I get to Daniel, first chapter, and verse 8 says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. So I said, all right, all right, this guy had some kind of determination. All right. So I kept going, and verse 17 says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge in all skill, in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. So I said, all right, this guy had the same thing I've had going on. Okay, maybe we can go somewhere with this. So I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm keep going. And the first seven Sabbath would have been April 2nd. So I said, all right, cool. Praying, praying, and a week before April 2nd rolls around, we had to hand in the money. Our church, the money didn't come. So I'm like, all right, God, what's going on? I asked my mom, I call her. Mom is saying, well, if you don't have the money, you don't want to lead these people up a gum tree and, you know, just leave them there stuck. So it was a painful call. I had to call the lady back and say, look, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just don't have the money. So for the next couple of weeks, I was a little distraught. I, I was like, Lord, why would you bring me this far to leave me? 
So about mid-May, I have another dream. So this dream starts, and it opens up with Joe and I sitting at like a rooftop party. And we're looking out at this rooftop party. And we can see what looks like We can see what looks like three suns in a Venn diagram rotating, and they're coming closer to us. So Joe turns to me and says, you know, Jesus is coming again soon, right? I say, yeah, I know, I know, I know. She goes, so what are you doing about it? I said, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I went through the whole liturgy. She said, okay, cool, cool. She says, so what about the seventh Sabbath thing God told you to do? I said, well, you know, I didn't have the resources, God didn't provide the funds, I didn't have the time to get it done. She says, sounds like you're making excuses for yourself. So then I leave, and I go for a walk. Now, the first voice, the voice from the first dream, came back to me in the second dream and said to me the same thing Joe said. You know, Jesus is coming again soon, right? How are you living for him? What are you doing? I said the same answers. Then the voice tells me, I want you to have a Bible treasure hunt where you encourage people to get in the word and remember that Jesus is coming again soon. So I said, okay, cool, cool, cool. How am I supposed to do this? The voice says, pray. I said, where am I supposed to do this? The voice says, on your blog. So this is my blog. And, and, and I said, all right, fine, I'll do it. And then I leave. I go back and sit down. And Joe and I are looking out into the distance yet again. And we see what looks like wavy lines. But as it comes closer, it looks like, like, like a ghost. So Joe turns to me and says the same thing. Well, you know Jesus is coming again soon, right? What are you doing for him? How are you living for him? You know, what about the seven Sabbath thing? So I tell her the same answers. And at that moment, there was what seemed like a bright light, followed by loud sound. And then I started scrambling. I was turning around, just handing out tracks here and there, trying to do this like pseudo, you know, Bible treasure hunt, if you will like the voice told me to do, and, and then I woke up. But then I woke up with the feeling that, you know, whatever the voice told me to do in this dream, I had to get it done quickly. I had this sense of urgency. So I, I formulated a plan within the next week to get this thing done. I prayed, I fasted. I said, Lord, I'm going to do this thing right. And I came up with a plan, and I put it on my blog. So after I put it on my blog, you know, I waited a couple weeks, no entries. You know, four weeks went by, no entries. And I felt like, Lord, what's going on here? I mean, why would you bring me this far yet again? I'm doing what you told me to do, and you're leaving me. So I was doing my worship one day, and I was coming up into the rich young ruler. And I said to God, you know what? This is two strikes. I'm a baseball guy, okay? I like the Mets, Lord. I mean, pray church for our season this year. It doesn't look good. But I said, Lord, this is two strikes. Okay, three strikes, and you're done. So you got to talk to me. You got to tell me what you exactly want me to do. Because everything I thought you want me to do so far has fallen through. So I'm doing my worship, and I'm saying, Lord, I need not only spiritual guidance from you, but I need professional career guidance. I didn't just want to work and earn money. I wanted to be happy doing what I was doing. So I'm talking to God. I'm asking him, you know, what should I do? And I come across the story of the rich young ruler. And for some reason, I've heard this story millions of times, but it, it struck a chord in me this day. And it wasn't that the rich young ruler didn't love God. I mean, he loved him. He received blessings because of his obedience. He had a desire to follow Jesus, but here was his weak points. He was distracted by his possessions. He loved God as much as his wealth, and he could not follow Jesus wholeheartedly. So I closed worship, and I started asking questions. Lord, is this me? I mean, what's going on here? What, what am I missing? And then I look into my room as I get in, and a voice comes to me, an audible voice. And the voice says, Look around you, you have all the resources here. 
So yet again, I thought it was maybe some stale Ezekiel bread I had or, you know, some wrong vitamins. I didn't know. So I step back out. I step back in. And the voice tells me the same thing. Look around you. You have all the resources here. So I'm like, nah, nah, maybe it's just me. So I do it the third time. I step out and step back in. The voice tells me, look around you. You have all the resources here. Now, church, I have a confession to make. Church, I have a confession to make. Um, over the years, I've amassed quite a few pairs of sneakers. And um, um, 450 to be exact. Whoa, 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 come on now. Come on now, church. I mean, on this side of it, it's easy to say that because you know what happens when you don't have Christ centered in your life. You know, you find love in other vices. And I, and I realize that now, but at the time, I was like, Lord, I, I mean, you, you, you really want me to get rid of everything? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm staring at 450 pairs of sneakers. I'm staring at over 200 for the caps. I'm staring at a 55-inch TV that I purchased um, Black Friday, 2010. And I'm like, Lord, are you serious here? So I said, okay, you know what? Just as Daniel purposed in his heart to follow God, I'm going to purpose in my heart because I'm giving you this chance to get it done. I said, Lord, if you really want this to go, you let it sell. So I set up a, a web store and I started selling them. And church, you wouldn't believe it. They were going. They were going. And they're still going. And um, I started at 450 pairs, and now I'm down to a humble 120. <laughs> humble, humble, humble church, humble. But, but I'm still going. I'm still selling. I'm giving away as well. Um, no, I'm not taking any offers after. But <laughs> I've been selling, and I've been giving it away and, and, and getting it out of my life. And then I felt the Spirit telling me, Mike, I want you to come away from all your secular distractions. We're talking... We're talking all kinds of, of, of things like Facebook and all kinds of social media and TV and music. And I read this verse. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear, whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. So I'm like, okay, the Lord is telling me it's time for a change. Here's what God's plan was. He was going to change my character by using circumstance and time. And this is me. I had a bunch of distractions. I had secular music, TV movies, video games, you know, material possessions, as we can see, um, social, and, and, and social media and internet browsing. So the Lord was telling me, Mike, I want you to get rid of all these things. Get rid of them. Focus on me and hear my voice. So I'm like, all right, God. Uh, all right, let's see what happens. So Friday comes, and I said, Lord, I did ask you for spiritual guidance and professional guidance. And I said, you know, you, you've answered one. You know, the sneakers are going. You're, you're, you're changing my character. You're pulling me away from all the distractions of the world. But what about my professional life? What am I supposed to do? And an audible voice comes to me and tells me, I want you to start a cab service, kind of like a dollar cab service, but for free. So I'm like, for free? He's like, yes, for free. And I want you to hand out tracts and literature, have heavenly music playing in the background, you know, show sermons inside of this, this cab, and, and then just go up and down and, and spread the word. So I said, okay, okay, sounds like a plan. So I tell Joe, I tell my mom about it. And the idea of a daycare and a food bank also came up. So we prayed about everything. We said, all right, Lord, does this make sense? And we're reading, we're reading, and it seemed to all fall in line with what God wants us to do as Adventists. So I said, okay. So I started reading, how are we going to put all of these things together under one umbrella? So we had the cab service, we had the daycare, and we had the food bank. And the only thing that came up when I typed it in Google was what? A nonprofit organization. Church, nonprofits are no joke. Nonprofits are no joke. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of legalities, and I wasn't too sure if, Lord, is this what you really want me to do? So I'm reading these verses, and it's, it's, it's playing over my head. It's playing over my head. 
And we come up with the name, the motto, the description, and the mission statement for this nonprofit. It's called the Seven Scroll. You're probably wondering why. Because the seven was in all dreams, subliminally, and a scroll was in all dreams, subliminally. So I just put it all together, the seventh scroll. Okay, so I prayed. I said, Lord, mission statement, how am I going to get this thing done? And believe it or not, church, one night, stayed up real late, and, and, and God just was talking to me, and I just was writing it down and writing it down. And after a few edits, this is what we came up with. So the Lord is telling me, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, just go forward. And I'm saying, all right, Lord, how am I supposed to really get this thing off the road now? So it's time to pick board members. And church, many are called, many are called, <laughs> but few are chosen. I'm asking God, who should I put on this board? And he's giving me a list of people. And I, as I go to them, people are telling me, well, Mike, that's a... That's a good thing you're doing. But, you know, I have a lot of things to do, so I, I don't know. And I'm getting brushed off, brushed off, brushed off. And finally, God gives me a core group of people. I would let them stand, but, I, you know, I, I don't want to embarrass them. Matter of fact, I am going to embarrass them. <laughs> Can my board please stand, wherever you are? Oh, they, they nervous, they nervous. All right, church, leave it, leave it. So then we move on, we move on, and it's September. And we're like, okay, how are we going to get this done? So we put in the paperwork for, to become a nonprofit officially. And by September 22nd, we become officially a nonprofit. The Seven Scroll Inc. is in the books. We're legal. We can operate within the New York State. So we said, all right, God, you're moving. You're getting us somewhere. So I'm praying now. I'm praying. And I read that when the Israelites wanted to get closer to God, they would fast twice a week instead of once. So I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to fast twice this week. And I want you to talk to me. So I'm fasting, and I'm thinking over this whole cab service thing. Okay, God said he wants me to have a dollar cab, but what's inherently wrong with a dollar cab? You know, take away the fact that they drive crazy. I mean, you have to squeeze in between nine people just to sit down and then squeeze in between another 20 just to get out. So then I'm putting in Google and you know, the idea of a shuttle bus comes up. So I'm like, okay, this could work. I mean, we can have video in it. We can have enough space for people to come in and come out, possibly even a wheelchair. So I said, okay, that's fine, let's go. So we we'll find a, a company called Shepherd's Brothers Inc. And uh, this is the bus I see online right here. And I'm like, all right, Lord, if you really want this to be ours, you'll let this happen. So I call up the people and I'm like, oh, Hi, you know, my name is Mike. You know, I'm the president of this illustrious nonprofit organization. <laughs> and, and we want to buy the shuttle bus from you. So the guy goes, all right, cool. We're located in Candigua, New York, about seven hours away from here. And, you know, if you ever want to come up and check out the bus, you'll feel free to, and we'll work out the paperwork then. So one of my board members, Brother Semper, um, I call him up, and I said, all right, Brother Semper, you know, I really need your help. You know, I can look at the bus from the outside and say, look, this bus looks great, and I'm ready to sign. But you can tell mechanically if this thing is sound. So I'm asking Brother Sam, can we do it? Brother Sam said, no, Mike, you know, I have a lot of things to do. I can't go, I can't go. So I said, all right, Brother Sam, all right, all right. So I call the person, call the guy back, I'm like, well, you know, I find it hard with scheduling to come seven hours away. Because remember, we're in Brooklyn, New York. He goes, all right, all right, well, call us back if you find anything, and, and maybe we can go from there. So three days later, they call me back. So I'm like, okay. So they call me back, and they say, well, you know, Mike, we've been reviewing the, the books and looking over what your nonprofit plans on doing with this bus, and um, we'll meet you halfway. So that would have been Albany. So I get off the phone, I'm like, wow, God, you're moving. I mean, you're taking all the excuses out of the book. So I call Brother Sam back. Brother Sam, can we do this? Well, Mike, you know, I got painting to do. I don't know. So I'm like, all right, Brother Sam, all right. So five days later, these people call me back again. So I said, okay, all right. They said, Mike, you know what? We've really been, I don't know, but your, your organization really has been on our mind. And we'll meet you three quarters of the way. So that would have been Mount Vernon. 
So I'm saying, wow, okay, God, you're taking every excuse out of the book. So I called Brother Semp again. <laughs> Brother Semp, Brother Semp, can we do this? Can we do this? Well, Mike, I don't know. I, I said, all right, Brother Semp, all right, all right. So I get a call on Sunday from them. And um, they call me and they say, well, Mike, I know it's not business hours, but, you know, we really want to give you guys this bus. And... Um, We'll meet you wherever you want us to meet you. So I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh. All right, so I call Brother the Semp, Brother Semp. I'm telling him to come to the church now. I'm saying come to the church now, Brother Semp. Can we do this? All right, Mike, but you know, you have to make it quick because I have things to do. I said, all right, Brother Semp, all right, all right, all right. So bus comes and um, the people are on their way, so they give me a call. Mike, we're down here, we're down here. And I'm saying, okay, okay. But every step of the way, every time they call me, they say, well, you know this bus costs $70,000, right? And I'm saying, yeah, I, I know. They said, well, you know, if we're coming this, this far just for you to give you the bus, we need to make sure you have the money. And I'm saying, I'm hearing a voice in my head telling me, commit. So I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I have the money. I have it. I have it. So he goes, you sure now? Because, you know, a lot of people lead us to the point of a cliff and push us over. So we need to make sure you have the money. So I said, yeah, yeah, I have it. And every time I tell him I have the money, Lord, I told him I had the money. Help me, help me. So finally they come on, what was that, Monday? They get down here. And um, I'm sweating now. I'm like, Lord, these people are here. I don't have the money. You didn't drop it out the sky. I didn't win the lotto. I, 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 nothing happened. Lord, what, what is going to happen? How am I going to pay these people the 70000 So I bomb it down here today. And I get to the corner. And I'm saying, well, look, listen. Peter was hung upside down. James was boiled. No, John was boiled. Something's going to happen to me today. <laughs> Something's going to happen. So I hit the corner right here, and I get on my knees, I'm like, Lord, please save me, please, just drop the money, something, help me. I'm gonna die today, you brought me this far to kill me, why, why? I turn the corner, and I see a big burly white guy. I said, Lord, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. But at least I'm gonna die right in front of the church. At least I'm gonna die right in front of the church. So I get to the man, he's like, hi, my name is Mr. Jan, how are you doing? And I'm like, hi, my name is Mike. Um, he said, come check out the bus. So I'm praying, Lord, drop the money, drop the money, do something, drop the money. Check out the bus. Church, the bus, beautiful. So this is how it looked. This is Jamel. I don't know if you can see him in the corner. And um, the bus was beautiful. Inside, oh, man, beautiful, clean seats. And it had TVs in it, just like we wanted to put sermons on it. So he's like, all right, this is something we want to do. So we come around the front, and I asked Brother Sam, I said, Brother Sam, is this something we really want to commit to? He said, Mike, well, it looks good to me. I think we should do it. And at that point, Brother Taylor comes barging in. A wagwan in here. Wagwan. Wanna never tell me you're putting a boss in ya. So I'm like, oh. I'm like, Brother Taylor, Brother Taylor, chill. Please, please, Brother Taylor, let God work, let God work. Mm-mm, eyes head deacon. Taylor, please, please, Brother Taylor, let, wait, 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 wait. So he said, all right. But may I have to see what's going on? So now you have this, like, you know, rough voice Jamaican guy. And he got a white guy from upstate, and he's getting kind of nervous. Like, okay, are they going to jump me here? So I'm saying, all right, Brother Taylor, please, please, but just wait, just wait, 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 wait. I'll explain to you after. So Brother Semp says, you know what, Mike, this is something we should commit to. So we commit, and we tell the guy, okay, you know, so what's the process now? How do we purchase this bus. He said, well, you just got to give the money. That's how we got to do it. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay. He said, you know what? Let me make a few phone calls. So he goes <clears throat> around the corner and he makes a few phone calls and we get on the bus and we're like, Lord, come on, you got to come through right now. We need you. We need you in a special way. We're praying. We're praying hard, earnestly, church. The man comes back around the corner and he says, Mike, Tell me a little bit more about this organization. So I tell him what we plan on doing with the bus, and 
that it's, it's not about financial gain. It's all about spiritual growth. I said, this is what God told us to do, and we're just following through on the commission as best we could. And he said, okay. You know, I was talking with the, the heads upstate, and, you know, we really like this location. It's pretty secure. I like this neighborhood. Um, and we like what you plan on doing with the bus. And, you know, we never, we never do this. But um, here are the keys. And um, just tell me how I can catch a red-eye flight out of here. So now I'm starting to panic. I'm like, I wanted to hug him. I wanted to jump. I wanted to scream. I wanted to pray everything all at once. And I'm like, oh, well, well, I can drop you to LaGuardia. I, I could drop you. So I got in a van, and we dropping him. He's telling me about his kids, his family, his home, how life is upstate. And we finally drop him off. And on the way back, I'm talking with Carlton, and I'm like, wow, man, God is crazy. I, I, didn't, I never saw this coming. Church, that's like saying I'm thirsty. And a store owner comes to my house, gives me something to drink, and tells me, you know, pay whenever you're ready. That doesn't happen in this day and age. So I'm like, OK. So for that whole Sabbath, I don't know if you noticed the church. The, church, uh, the bus was in the parking lot. I don't know how many people noticed. But I'm praising God. I'm on the bus. I'm living on the bus. My mom is like, well, there's no showers on the bus, so you might want to come home once or twice. <laughs> if I'm living on the bus, I'm praying because these people still need to get paid. So I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And a week later, the people call us. Well, before the people call us, you know, I have to tell pastor. So I told pastor, pastor said, get out of town. You got to be lying. Pastor comes on the bus with Sister Mountain, and they're like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. Oh, my goodness. So I'm like, all right, so we're praying. And a week later, the bus company calls me. and said, Mike, um, we have some news for you. So the guy sounded really somber, so I was kind of nervous. I said, okay, so hit me with it. He goes, we took the bus off the market. We've given it to you. But something strange happened. We started getting an influx in offers on this bus, even though we took it off the market. And I'm saying, okay. He said, well, now we have to make a business decision. And if you don't come up with the money, then we're going to have to sell it to someone who has the money. So I said, okay. I said, you know what? My God is more than faithful. He's a fair man. If we are supposed to have this bus, you'll have your money. If not, you're more than welcome to come and get the bus. He said, okay. So a week goes by. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm like, Lord, help me. Something. And finally, they come on a Wednesday. I think it was, what, November 9th? And they say, oh, um, well, Mike, where's the money? And I have nothing. I have nothing, church. Nothing to give the man. So he said, all right, Mike, I'm sorry. We're going to have to take the bus. So he takes the bus, and I'm looking out. I'm looking out. I'm watching the bus leave. And I'm thinking, Lord, why would you take this bus? I mean, you brought it all the way up from upstate New York. You brought it all the way down here. And then you registered it. You, you gave us, you know, keys for it. We, we had it. Inspection, everything. And then you take it away. What's the point? So I'm praying. I'm asking Lord. I'm like, Lord, what's, what's happening? And at that moment, an old white guy came up and tapped me on my shoulder. And he said, young man, it's a good thing you didn't get that bus. I would have gotten a diesel bus instead of a, a gas. So I thought nothing of it. I'm just still watching the bus ride off into the sunset. <laughs> and I'm lost. I'm like, church, wh why? Why? I come inside. I pray. But the tailor comes up to me and says, hey, would I get a diesel instead of a gas? <laughs> so I'm saying, all right, all right. And then as I'm leaving the church, Brother Albert comes up to me and asks me, was that bus a diesel? And I'm like, no. He goes, well, don't worry. God will take care of you. And I'm like, OK. I come back to prayer meeting, and Brother Pilgrim, you were killing me that, that prayer meeting. You were killing me. I mean, he's singing all kinds of funeral songs. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Lord, I guess you really wanted to take this. You, you, you wanted to snuff the life out of me. And I wanted to tell Brother Pilgrim something, but I said, you know, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. Anyway, for the next couple of weeks, I'm asking God, give me some confirmation. Let me know that this is exactly what you want me to do. 
So I had to take my CDL exam because the bus was a 25-seater. So I passed my CDL with flying colors. And I was like, OK, God, I need something else. So I'm listening to a sermon um, by Elder Ed Reed. And he was talking about Hiram Edson and how um, you know, after the great disappointment, the brethren were really destroyed. They weren't sure if this was the Advent movement that they were supposed to be taking part in. And they asked God, they said, God, we need a sign, a message from you. And God gave them the sanctuary message, which is the reason why we are Adventists today. And this sanctuary message was given to them in the same place, Candigua, New York, where the bus came. So I said, okay, maybe God, I, I could see your fingerprint on this, all right. So I'm asking some more, Lord, help me, help me. And the Lord comes up with a building where, where we can house all of these entities in. And he also comes up with an interesting idea. I was reading about you know, a veggie oil kit that you can place on a bus, but actually the bus will run on used vegetable oil. And this could only be run on a diesel engine. Now remember, when I asked God what happened, why he took the bus, on that same day, three separate people came up to me and asked me if the bus was diesel. So now I'm connecting all the dots and it's all making sense. So by December, I'm like, okay, God, you've given me all these points. Let's get this ball rolling. Let's go. Let's go. But January 2011 came, 2012, and it mirrored 2011. I was still distraught. I was like, Lord, what's going on? I mean, you gave me all this, but I still have no bus, no ministry, no money. I mean, what are we doing here? So I started asking people around, you know, I, I, what should I do? You know, is God really here for me? So I asked my mom, Mom, what, what do you think I should do? And she goes, well, don't worry, my son. Everything will be okay. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, all right. So I asked Joe's side of the family. You know, they're real trinnies. I said, you know, what should I do? What do you think I should do? Don't hurt your head, boy. Don't hurt your head. God will take care of you real good. So I'm like, all right. All right. I asked a security guard in my building. He's African. I asked him, you know, what would you do? He said, what are you saying here? Don't worry. Jesus will take care of you. Everything you want. From the top to the bottom, man. He will take care of everything. So I said, all right. All right. Now, I wanted to call my grandmother in England. She's Jamaican. You know, the Edward side of the family. Deep roots in Jamaica. And I wanted to call her, but I kind of stopped because I know what she was going to tell me what she's been telling me since I was a young child. My cow. Wanty, wanty, nah getty, getty. But getty, getty, nah wanty, wanty. So I said, you know what? I'm not even gonna call grandma because I know what's gonna happen. I know what's gonna happen. So I'm here, I'm waiting, I'm saying, Lord, help me, help me. And I'm reading the story of, you know, the Israelites when they're coming out and Moses is guiding them. And I noticed a parallel between the Israelites and myself. I mean, every step of the way that God was leading them, and he showed them signs. They crossed the Jordan, they're, they're moving. Every single sign, they seem to forget and start complaining. Lord, why aren't you helping me? What's going on? And I'm saying, Lord, help me. But then I realized, you know, our spiritual walk with God has to be always at a high, no matter what goes on in our life we almost must maintain that relationship with God where it's always at a peak, no matter what goes on around us. And at that time, you know, it was, it was coming on to Sabbath, and I went to bed, and I had a dream. Yes, church, another dream. <laughs> and in this dream, it opened up with me at, I don't know if you remember the old church on Schema Home where we used to have Federation? Yeah. Right, so it opened up there, and I was standing in the back, I was uh, waiting for Joe and my mom to finish using the bathroom. So I'm just standing in the back, looking out into the um, church. And it seemed like someone came behind me and hugged me. But I couldn't see the person's face. And the person told me, Job 21, Psalms 21, and Ephesians 4.12. So I'm saying, OK. And at that moment, I just run to the front of the church. I fall down on my knees. And I start crying, crying uncontrollably. 
Then Joe comes up behind me, taps me on my shoulder, and says, what's wrong? And I repeat the same verses to her. Job 21, Psalms 21, and Ephesians 4.12. And then I woke up. But when I woke up, I hadn't had a dream in a long time. Remember, the last dream was mid-May of 2011, and now I'm having a dream, January 2012, so I'm like, okay, I'm a little nervous. And I haven't read, I'm currently in, what's the Second Chronicles? So I haven't read Job in its entirety. I haven't read Psalms in its entirety, so I was kind of nervous to what message God was really trying to tell me. So half of the day went by, and curiosity got the best of me, so I had to flip it open. I said, all right, let me find out what's going on here. And the message was decoded. Job 21, Job was basically saying, Lord, why do the wicked seem to prosper? Why do they seem to be having everything when I'm trying to, just trying to live? And it seems like I'm, not, I'm, I'm dying, I'm falling. Psalms 21 says, David was telling God, Lord, I'm giving you thanks for blessings you will give me. They haven't come, but I'm giving you thanks given for stuff that are to come. And then Ephesians 4.12 says, for the equipping of the saints to finish the work. So you put all that together, that was basically how I felt. Why is everyone else having a shuttle bus? I don't have one. Why is everyone else have a ministry? I don't have one. But I should be able to thank God in advance because he will equip me with the tools to finish the work. Amen. So I felt kind of, you know, relieved. I'm like, all right, we're going somewhere now. And I'm reading the story of, I believe it was uh, King Hezekiah. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, church. But um, he, he laid all his plans on the table in front of God. Um, and I put everything on the table. You know, March came along. So I said, you know, I got to preach the 31st. Lord, I got to have something. You got to provide the bus, the building, the ministry. Something has to give. Because how am I going to go in front of your people with, any, with nothing? I said, you know what? Lord, if you don't give me something, then I can't preach. I'm going to have to call Brother Chris last minute and say, look, Brother Chris, look. I can't do this. Um, I had the flu. <laughs> Something. But I kept pressing on. I said, Lord, you know, how am I going to do this? And it was crunch time. So I put all my plans in front of God. We had the real estate. We had loans. We had, you know, financing. We had new and used buses and donations and proposals. We put everything in front of God. And I said, Lord, I'm not even going to choose any way that I want to get done. This is all that I can foresee ever happening. Please, you just guide the way. So we pray and we pray. And church, every day this month, I've seen God close the door on every proposal we put up. Every proposal. And I'm saying, Lord, you know, what's going on? What's going on? So this week, as I'm thinking about this, and I, you know, I have to preach, and you know, it's too late to tell Brother Chris, look, look, Brother Chris, I can't do this anymore. I'm thinking about it, and I'm saying, Lord, what's happening? And church, it would have been great to have the bus or the ministry or, or the building or whatever by now, and to have a beautiful testimony for you. But I guess that wasn't in God's plan. You know, it would have been a great story. But I realized God was teaching me something far deeper, far deeper. You know, we can go on for days plugging in, you know, different themes that we can see here. You can see love, you can see faith, you can see hope, salvation, redemption. But that's just scratching the surface. I was talking to one of my mentors last week, who shall remain nameless, <clears throat> Brother Jeff Samuelson. <laughs> and we were on the topic of, of marriage. And he was telling me, Mike, you know, my wife can be really demanding at times. I go, wow, how do you cope? He goes, it's easy. We have a loving relationship. We have a loving relationship. So even when it may seem that she's very demanding, I know she has my best interests at heart. Preach <laughs> And then it hit me. It hit me, church. It hit me. This whole journey from January 2011 till now, God was just trying to have an intimate relationship with me. And Lord, Lord was trying to say, no matter what happens, I can send you there, here, everywhere. 
But if you love me, you'll do it because we have that relationship. But church, this message is twofold. Not only does God want a special and intimate relationship with each one of us here today, he had another message. He was bringing me back to the old truths, right? The state of the dead, the health message, the spirit of prophecy, the sanctuary, the law of God, victory over all sin and righteousness by faith. But I was coming home one day, I was on 59th Street. I was coming back from a meetup I was selling these bad boys right here. I, I never got to wear them. I never did. But anyway, I was selling these. And I was coming back. And I was asking God, well, God, why do I have to preach? Why is this so necessary? You know, I'm the type of guy, I wouldn't mind just standing in the back. And, and, and you know, prayer meeting comes along. And I give a little testimony. You know, God gave me a bus. He gave me a building and ministry. And I'll sit down. And if you find out about it, God bless your heart. If you don't, then I'm cool with that as well. I'd rather be low key. So I'm asking God, why should I preach? Why is this so important? So I'm standing on a platform at 59th Street and I'm looking down and it's crowded church, crowded. And it was rush hour and it seemed a little strange because 25 minutes go by and no four train. So I'm like, okay. And slowly I can see people going up to take the six train. So then signs start coming, okay? We start feeling the rumbling of the ground. You know when you feel the rumble, you don't know if it's that track over there, upstairs, downstairs. You don't know where it is. But even though there was rumbling, people were still leaving. And then I'm asking God, so talk to me. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then we start feeling the breeze. You know when you feel a breeze, you're like, ooh, train's coming. I'm going to be out. But no train. And then we saw light. And I said, all right, train got to be coming now. I see the light. But throughout all these signs, people were still going. And the minute I got on the train, the Spirit told me, do you see what just happened? See, many of us have been in this Advent message for so long, and we've been waiting. You know, we may have, a, we may have an intimate relationship with God, but we're not recognizing the signs and how serious this thing is. Ooh, I started to cry on the train, church. I was like, wow, God, that was so deep. And I'm looking. And I see this, this, this um, text. I go back and I'm reading Daniel and Revelation. And, and I get into Matthew 24. And it says, now from the fig tree, learn her parable. When her branches now become tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that the summer is nigh. Even so ye also, when ye see all these things, know ye that he is nigh, even at the doors. Church, we're going to go back to the timeline that Pastor was talking to us about. You know, we know the signs has happened already. You know, you got the great earthquake, the black sun, the bloody moon, the falling stars. But there's one part that Pastor didn't say, and that was in Luke when he speaks about the distress of nations with perplexity. Now, when you read about what perplexity is, the Greek translation means to be in straits without resources, with no way out. Church, we're in this, this distress of nations with perplexity. That started in 2008. And that's the sign that, look, we know what's coming. A great crisis is ahead. But church, I say all this to say, when Ellen White says, are we to wait until the fulfillment of prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value would our words be then? Skip, in clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us the great day of the Lord is at hand, even at the doors. Church, God is calling for a revival and reformation in our lives. Not only does God want a relationship with us, he wants us to be able to tell when he's coming. Church, this is a serious message when you realize how solemn this thing is. You see, church, a relationship takes time. It takes time. I can't just come to anyone's house, break open the fridge, sit down, bust open a can, a Malta, and start drinking. I can't do that. But if we have a relationship, I could probably put my feet on the table and you wouldn't say anything. God wants a relationship with us. 
And a relationship takes time. Yes. And guess what, church? We don't have a lot of time left. So church, today, I want us to have a three-minute individual prayer where we understand this message that God is coming again soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please open our hearts to you. Lord, this is a solemn message. We need you. <laughs> please, Lord. Church, um, I'm a fourth generation Adventist. Um, Adventism is, is so deep in my family, it's, it's, it's all I know. And I know what normally happens during appeals. You know, the spirit may be talking to us, but we get to a point where we're really nervous about what other people may think. So we don't come up. We kind of just stay to ourselves and we fight what God has to us. Has to, has to say to us, and we probably come about 20 minutes later to the pastor's study and say, all right, pastor, you know, I, I couldn't come up. Can you pray for me in the side? Can you help me? But church, this appeal is for everyone. We've all backslidden. We've all taken our relationship with God for granted, and we can all strengthen it. So Lord, at, at this time, the Pathfinders will be passing out, you know, sheets of paper. And I want us to write down on these paper three things that we want God to really help us with, three concerns in our lives that are plaguing us, on top of the fact that we do need a better relationship with him. So as Sister Rhonda sings, I want us to take this message seriously. Write it down. You don't have to come up. We'll collect the papers. We'll put it in this prayer box. And I'll be here every week, every day this week at 7 o'clock. I'll be here and I'll be praying, praying over these, these prayer requests. If you'd like to join me, you can come. But I'll be here every, every day this week praying because this is, this is serious, church. We don't have time. So as Sister Rhonda sings, please write down what concerns you have, and write down the fact that we need God in a mark and special way.
prayer requests? Pastor, would you like to come up and help us close? In my humble opinion, one of the most powerful forces for good in this world is a young man who allows God to direct his life. There is no telling what he can accomplish. And Michael, I just want to let you know, I sat there and I felt so proud. And I felt so humbled. And I just want to let you know that the story is still being written. It's not over yet. God is still working in the background. And one day again, you will be able to stand up and share with this church what God did from here onward. And I'm praying that I will be there to hear the rest of the story. May God bless you. I just want to remind our young people, we'll be having our baptism at the end of this month, as Pastor Mounter announced. And our Bible class will be at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Let us come together, continue to study his word, and prepare for his coming, because Jesus is coming soon. May God bless you. Pastor? Thank you, Doc. Proud of Michael. Can you say amen? amen. You know, you know, you know, he never, you know, he never misses prayer meeting. Last Wednesday night, I was over in the, in the office, couldn't get out. And um, at the end of prayer meeting, we were still there. And I saw Michael, I saw the group coming out of prayer meeting while we were still in the office trying to get out. But Michael, I admire you. And um, if you watch him on the basketball court, he's gifted. You watch him around church, he's one of our deacons. He's one of our ordained deacons in this church. And Mike, I'm very proud of you. You're the kind of guy that any man would love to say, that's my son. Proud of you. Keep it up. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one who cries around here. <laughs> Preaching, you know, when, when, when you stand up and you stand between the porch and the altar and the Holy Spirit falls upon you, let it flow. Don't be embarrassed. I didn't use my handkerchief, so you can use mine today. God bless you. Wasn't that awesome? And like Dr. Harrigan says, we like to hear the rest of the story. So keep on. When you pray, 
You come in here, a.m. or p.m.? P.m. Now, Tuesday night, there's a funeral. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you stay here. No, we'll, we'll take care of the dead. You take care of the living. <laughs> sister Effie Smith is coming. Just come here, Sister Smith. Sister Smith's sister will be funeralized here on Tuesday night. And um, so God bless you, Sister Effie. You're a beautiful lady. You're here for every funeral. You're here ushering and you're supporting. So members, let's come out and support her. She's lost her sister in death. And we want to be there to support her. So God bless you. All right, Michael, thank you once again. God bless you. And Sister Deli, come here. Come, come, come. Come. Many of you don't know to whom he belonged. That lady with the afro back in, was it 85? This is the lady with the afro in 85. I want a picture of that for blackmail. I want to keep it. God bless you both. Let's give them a hearty amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We'll stand and sing our closing hymn this morning, 614. Those of you who have arrived since the official welcome, welcome. We appreciate your presence. Thank you for choosing Handsome Place. Our closing hymn and then the benediction.